Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, pretty humid here this morning. <laughs> I think it's about 85 inside the store, and it's probably close to that humidity, too. Anyway, today's class is on uh, the principles of sustainable gardening. Now, it is not easy, or maybe it is an impossible goal to have a sustainable garden, but we'll talk about how to get close to that. So sustainable gardening is when you don't have any, you don't have to bring anything in and you don't have to throw anything away. That's the goal. Uh, but it's, you know, in this, in a normal city, now if you had a lot out, you know, five miles outside the city, probably do that. Inside the city, they probably wouldn't let you do things like that. But uh, we'll I'll talk about the principles. Now, a couple of classes ago, we talked about perfect soil. Um, because when you have perfect soil, nothing goes wrong due to the soil. So soil, this is off a farm in Irvine, and the owner of the farm tells me this is the best soil he's ever farmed on. Well, this is about 85% sand. And uh, throughout Orange County, you know, at flat areas of Anaheim, Buena Park, Tustin, Santa Ana, uh, a lot of these areas, especially this side of the five freeway, have this soil. So it's perfect soil, it's very sandy. Uh, things you know grow quickly in it as long as you water and fertilize them. Um, as you get out toward the ocean, you get the clay soils. And in the old days, that was where they farmed. So if you go back into the 1800s, they farmed in Los Alamitos, Fountain Valley, parts of Costa Mesa because it's clay. So clay used to be called the rich soil. And this soil was called the poor soil because after the rains were over, totally dry. Los Alamitos, you know, that's clay soil over there, stayed wet until summer. So they actually can grow a bean crop or, you know, one or two crops in that soil because it retained the moisture. And anything that retains moisture also retains more nutrients. So that was considered the better soil. But the problem we're having nowadays is because the plants are grown incorrectly. So last week we talked about fixing those plants. Uh, the nursery industry has been told, starting about 40 years ago, don't grow plants in this. This is when my dad grew plants in when I was a kid. And you grow them in here, nothing happens if you water, 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 nothing happens. But when you start using compost, ground up dead trees as your growing medium, and it stays wet, everything rots because dead stuff is supposed to rot. And unfortunately, you know, they also use composted dead stuff, which means all the organisms that cause the rot are there in that compost. And you put that around the roots of your plant, you put it in clay soil, it rots. So that's our big problem nowadays is we're given the wrong soil to work with. They're told to use compost around the roots, which it doesn't belong. So uh, the main thing to know is the soil should be pretty much close to 100% mineral sand, silt, and clay is what soil is. And sand, silt, and clay is primarily quartz. You know what glass is? Glass is quartz. Uh, you melt soil, you get something that looks like glass because that's what soil is. It's, it's quartz primarily. There are some other types of soil based on limestone and basalt, you know, the black soil, the black grant. Uh, Black sands and Hawaii, I think, are basalt. Uh, but there are some limestone soils too. But most soils in the world are based on quartz. Different sizes and shapes of uh, quartz uh, molecules. So uh, this is what we want as dirt. If you don't, if you buy the wrong thing. So uh, unfortunately, the other part of our industry. Um, you know, you buy bulk soil from the bulk soil suppliers, the landscape suppliers, and they'll try to sell you something called topsoil. So they take this and they don't think this is good enough. So they mix it with uh, 40 to 60 percent compost. Now, in nature, there is some organic matter in here. It's less than one percent. But when you start making it 40 or to 60 percent compost, it wants to rot. 
and you put plants in there and they just start, you know, you don't have any root system because the roots are getting eaten up by this compost. Com you know, the bacteria that eat compost and the fungi that eat compost really don't tell the difference between roots, living roots and dead roots very well. So uh, you definitely don't want the organic matter in the soil. However, in nature, there's five inches on average of dead stuff on top of the ground. So that's where all that compost belongs. It belongs above the ground. And that's where the fungi, bacteria, earthworms, pill bugs, everything that eats the dead stuff lives there. The roots of the plants are down here on this and they still get the benefits. And that's where it's safer. Uh, to have the compost on the surface. So, so if you have the soil right, um, then everything else is easier. There, we'll, well, let's talk about watering first. So in watering, irrigation, if the soil is proper, there's no such thing as overwater. So unless the water sits there for a week and doesn't move, you're not going to have problems with overwatering. If the water moves through the soil at any rate at all, and generally in Orange County, they say the rate of movement of water through the soil is about between one quarter and one eighth of an inch per hour. So, you know, one quarter inch maybe in sandy soil and one eighth of an inch. So if you get rainfall more than a quarter inch an hour, you're going to have runoff all throughout Orange County. If it's if you have clay soil, even one eighth of an inch per hour will give you some runoff. So, so the irrigation, know that that's one key thing. So irrigation, we want it now. Plants. Here we talk about this first week. So plants root systems on average in Orange County, even in good soil, you might get to about a foot deep, about one foot deep root systems and generally if you want to grow a plant you know plants will survive with less water but if you actually want to grow something you want to grow a crop you want to keep that entire root system moist well how do you tell that do not use the little moisture meters that you buy at stores the little ones battery powered ones they are too sensitive to moisture in the soil they'll tell you it's really wet until your plants dried up totally. We, we hear that every week. People say, oh, I, I use my moisture meter and it still says it's wet. And you'll get the plant is totally wilted and dead. Uh, and that's the problem with moisture meters. The ones that are used in agriculture don't operate on electricity. They will operate on the pool of, well, atmospheric pool on water. <laughs> it's complicated, but it's a totally different type of instrument. And uh, 20 years ago, an agricultural agent said, this is the best way to measure moisture in the ground. This, so before farmers had the proper moisture probes that operate with that tech, you know, with the atmospheric pressure, they had uh, just pieces of rebar. And we know that with soil, you know, you know a block of clay when you're in kindergarten or elementary school, you work with clay. So when clay is moist, you can push anything through it. Once it's dry, there's no way to push anything through clay. And plants cannot get water out of dry clay. And sand and silt all work the same way. So they said farmers would walk around their fields every day, pretty much. And then just where they're irrigating, generally they would push this in the ground as hard as they can by hand. And they can push it in. Now farms usually have deeper soil than cities do. Uh, between 12 and 6 and 18 inches of penetration, they knew there that they were irrigating at the right amount. Um, so generally, uh, if you can push it down a foot in a city, or even 10 inches, you're pretty moist. That, that That's a good depth of moisture. Most of your roots are in that zone. Um, now, but, you know, I used to live in a house with clay soil. And I remember uh, 1998, I believe, we had 30 inches of rain. I could push this thing on the ground to the handle. It was just crazy. I was going, well, this is my backyard. It's probably never been able to push anything to the ground that deep. And suddenly, when we had 30, uh, what was it, 28 inches in here? Well, it was a crazy number anyway. Uh, I can push it all the way in. It was, I was just surprised. Right in the middle of my lawn, I can push it all the way in. 
So if the ground is wet, you can push this in. If it's dry, you cannot. Now we know what happens on grass. So after I was told that, I checked my lawn to see how the lawn was doing. So I had about a foot of moisture in the lawn, the lawn looked perfect. Drop down to about eight inches, you start getting those white tips on the grass. Get down to about six, you start getting brown blades. At four inches of moisture, so you can have four inches of wet soil, but dry below that, grass started disappearing. I couldn't believe it. It would just, it would go dormant. And in areas that went dormant, the blades would just disappear as it's dirt. And then about two weeks after I restored the moisture to 12 inches, the whole lawn came back. So grass has the ability to go to sleep. So the one the nice thing to know is that all the grass that's used for lawns can go to sleep for at least three months, no damage. So essentially this summer, you can just turn off your water and then come fall, turn it back on and you're fine. You could save all that water just letting your lawn, of course it looks terrible, looks like dirt, but it won't kill it. So if you're using sprinklers, so sprinklers, we have some rules for that. So it takes only about four minutes, yes. How far away do you check the water? Like if you have a citrus tree, how far out? Well, you check it before you normally water it. That's, that's what you want to check, right where you water it. So if you use drip system, you check there. If you use soap you check there. If you sprinkler, right, right in the middle of that area. So the main thing with sprinklers is that they put on about a quarter inch of water in only about four or five minutes. So the water is only wants to see water in four minutes at a time. So one cycle, four minutes, then you don't get any runoff. Because if you have a lawn that either has berms or slopes, then after four minutes, the lower areas start picking up more water than the high spots. You start getting this uneven pattern of, of, of moisture in your grass, even though your water, even though your sprinklers are pretty much normal, you're getting uneven distribution of the water. So four minutes at a time, and I learned this back in the 80s because my first lawn had this, berms and slopes. And I, you know, I thought, well, they said you want to water deeply and infrequently. So I watered every three days, 40 minutes, and I had totally dry spots on those areas. I couldn't understand it. I go, this is weird. So I cut back my watering to what I did to start the seeds, which was five minutes, three times a day, nine, noon, and three. And the whole lawn came back in two weeks. And that's how, that's when we started looking at the literature saying that yeah, you only want to water four minutes at a time, but you may need to water more than once a day. So you space it an hour apart. So I was doing five minutes at five in the morning, six in the morning, and seven in the morning, and then doing that two days a week, and it was surviving with that. Uh, now, when it's 100 degrees, you're going to need about at least 50 minutes a week to keep a lawn green. Again, you can just let it go dormant for a while, but uh, to keep a lawn green now, so, so typically in the summer, you've got to water 45, you know, 44, 45 minutes a week. Typically in January, four minutes a week. That's the difference. Uh, after this heat wave's over, you can probably get by with about, you know, 30 minutes a week. And suddenly, you know, when we get to November, suddenly the watering is cut way low. So what we know about it, uh, that, so plants do what is called the evapotranspiration. The reason plants are losing water is because they open their pores to get in carbon dioxide. Now, with the higher levels of carbon dioxide we have in the air, you know, it's almost getting close to double what it was 100 years ago. Uh, um, Plants don't need to open their pores as well. So it's interesting. You don't have to water as much as you did 20 or 30 years ago because we have more carbon dioxide in the air. And even NASA admits that the Earth right now is about 20% greener. They said especially the deserts of the world are greener than they were in the 1980s because the increased carbon dioxide is allowing plants to grow under drier conditions. 
So, um, so plants open their pores to let in the carbon dioxide when the carbon dioxide level in the leaf is high enough because they're using carbon dioxide in photosynthesis along with water to make sugars. Um, carbon dioxide levels high enough in the leaf, they close the pore. Uh, so that if, it's, if they're using up too much oxygen, they open the pores. You know, plants like true cactus only open the pores at night. That's one way they save water is they, they open at night. Most plants open during the daytime and close their pores at night. Yeah. Anyway, so about the lawn, you know, uses about as much water as anything you're going to grow. So know that 45 minutes per week average during the summer. And then when it's 100 degrees, you, you go up even higher than that. But a foot of moisture for most production plants. I don't sell these rebars. Of course, you can buy a rebar, L-shaped rebar, four foot long at a hardware store. Uh, we do sell these fiberglass rods that you can also use. They're a lot lighter. That you can also use this push down as hard as you can to see how much penetration. So it doesn't have to be rebar. It doesn't have to be metal. It could be a wood dowel. It doesn't have to be that thick. It can be pencil thick. But generally with soil, uh, if you can push down and get a foot penetration, you're going to have good growth in your plants. Now, again, if, if you don't need it to grow, you know, if it's just a shrub, a hedge, a uh, shade tree, you can let it go pretty dry till this plant starts wilting. Now, just be aware there's a few plants that don't wilt, they just die. <laughs> so, so be careful with that. But, you know, it's hard to tell when a juniper is wilting or a cypress is wilting. But they can, and most junipers and cypress can get by in very, very low amounts of water. Among production plants, tomatoes are probably the most drought hardy of the crops we grow. But in general, if you want a good production, you, you need to keep the ground moist. So the research that's also been done in farming is that, uh, you know, in the old days, they didn't have the technology, so they flood irrigated their fields once a week. So it's really wet and really dry and really wet and really dry. Well, they found out through research that the more even you keep the moisture level, the better the plants grow and the less water you use. So in the production of plants, uh, they found out that you, you know, if you have a drip system and you water that thing 10, 15 times a day, you're saving water. As long as you don't overdo it, you're saving water. So they, they have farms in the Central Valley that say they turn on the water 18 times a day. They have, it's all run by computers. They have evaporation pans. They know how much water they need for the crop. And they said every hour they put water on the plant, how much you use the last hour. And they said as long as it's above 80 degrees, plants are using water. So, you know, in the Central Valley, especially near Sacramento, that can be 18, 18 hours a day that they're actually watering. But they said they save 30% of the water bill but using that method rather than the once a week methods that they were using previously. Yes. So, four minutes of water can be a quarter of an inch. Well, I think it's Moisture. You just are topping off the tank. You never want it to run drier than 10 inches. So you want to keep the, you know, on a production plan, you want to keep the moisture level right at 10 inches plus. So that's just topping off every day. You top off the tank, top off the tank. You never let that thing run dry. So when you let the soil run dry, your fruits are like canteens. They all shrink, like a tomato will shrink slightly, and then you water, just cracks. Or your navel oranges split, or your tangerines. So you get, we're getting a lot of that. People bringing split oranges, and that's just you let them get dry. The plant uses the water out of the fruit, and then you water. All of a sudden, can't the, the skin doesn't stretch back that quickly; it just breaks it open. So if you see cracks on 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 crops and things like that, that's uh, uneven moisture levels. So on the reverse, I have a green tree. Sometimes the fruit is smaller than the outside. Like here, it's just okay. Well, certain tangerines have the, what is called the loose skin or puffy skin. That's normal. That's cinematypes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so they, the University of California Davis had theorized that if you water deeply and frequently, you should have a deeper, better root system than you would if you watered lightly daily. So they did that test, and half the orchard watered every day lightly, half the orchard watered once a week deeply, and then they pulled the trees out of the orchard out by the end of the year, and they were surprised the better root system was on the side that they watered lightly daily. They didn't understand why. I mean, it's yeah, intuitively you would think if you water deeply and frequently, you'd have a better roots, but that's not what they saw. They saw the better root system on the side, they watered lightly daily. So there's no disadvantages to watering lightly daily on production plants. Again, you know, if you just have an ornamental plant and it doesn't need to flower or do anything special or grow, you just let it go dry. But if you need something to produce, you keep it evenly wet as well as you can. That seems to be the, the way your body's going. When you first plant something and your soil's dry, you make sure you water it though. I mean, we were next to a, we leased land on a organic farm for four years. And, you know, between crops, they had this real sandy soil. When they planted those crops, <clears throat> even though they're using a drip system, they ran their sprinklers out there and turned them on for five hours because they said that the drip irrigation system, that first watering, you, it doesn't cover enough area. It doesn't get everything wet enough. So they have to turn on the sprinklers, get everything wet. Once you get everything wet, once the drip will maintain it. So watch out with drip systems. Unless you put your dripper right on that plant, you've got to uh, do good watering. That initial watering. The questions on watering. I... Is it better to water at night? Oh, that's another good one. Okay, so the ag department told me that they allow farmers to water anytime they want. The only disadvantage of watering during the day is that the wind can blow sprinkler irrigation off target. That's really the only disadvantage. They said that on a production farm, plants use water faster than will evaporate off a pond. So if you're just watering the ground, well, the other flip side is on a farm, everything's evaporating as fast as the air will hold it, essentially. So it doesn't matter if the water's coming out of the plant leaves, are coming off the dirt, you're not gonna use more water because there's water on the ground. So if the water on the ground is evaporating, the water does not, will not evaporate out of the leaves because the air can't hold it anymore. So they said that there's no disadvantage of watering during the day on a farm just because everything's evaporating quickly anyway and the air can't hold any more than that. So. And water on the ground does not evaporate faster than water. They said plants use water faster than it would evaporate off the pond. So, yes. Here, the point you just described there, get a good watering between the plants, then you drip. In a garden where you maybe have low crops, radish, and you plant, how, what spacing should you have on your drip? Depends on the drip system. So I don't, we haven't kept up with the drip systems. Our, our distributors stopped carrying drip about 10, 20, 20 years ago. So I don't know what's out there anymore. Now the farms, of course, they use something called netafilm, which is a you know, uh, flat piece of plastic about an inch wide. They just run along their crop and it has holes about every foot. Uh, but they, you know, the problem with drip is it's not very um, sturdy. So they'll throw away that, that drip line. Every time they put a new crop, they just throw it away. And then they put in a new line every time they put a new crop and they put a new line. And so it's kind of wasteful that way. But a drip systems just aren't very, you know, that's the disadvantage of drip. Like I, I walk to an orchard almost every day. We let release some land from an orchard to grow plants on and they use drip systems, little, little micro sprinklers. Now, when I had micro sprinklers in my yard, they would not, most of them would last a year or a few months. They said they last five years, but generally 
they're not all going to be good. <laughs> and generally, they're always going to, you, know, you have to check them probably at least once a month or even once a week. I mean, the, of course, the farm managers walk through the orchards every week. They want to make sure that nothing's off because the drip system pieces just aren't as sturdy as regular sprinkler systems. Like regular sprinklers, you can usually get four or five years with no maintenance if it's a well-made sprinkler system. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of cheap stuff on that, too. So now, in the short run, uh, and especially with vegetable gardens, drip systems more efficient use of water. In a regular yard, even an orchard, in a long period, uh, um, sprinklers are not less efficient than drip. This because roots of plants go everywhere. So if you have a permanent landscape that's 10 years old, there's roots everywhere. Anywhere you water, there's roots. You're not going to waste water by watering away from your plant. The roots are there. Your plants' roots can grow 100 foot in about 20 years. So um, that, that is a tree, a big tree. You grow root systems 100 foot long within 20 years. So generally, you know, you can water with sprinklers on a mature yard and be quite efficient. Yeah, the garden space is you don't have a lot of room sometimes, so it's hard to use sprinklers. Uh, True. Yeah, everything's, you know, those corners, you yeah. got corners and all that, so you have to have either real sophisticated sprinklers or just go with drip. But generally, then, I, I think the drip, the closer the out emitter, the better coverage you can get on, say, a row of that or something. Oh, yeah. Like the 12 inch. Yeah. yeah. So I have a uh, avocado in the five gallon, and I'm going to put in the twenty five gallon. How often should I put? I bought it. every day. Yeah, uh, container plants generally, you know, most orchards, well, just about every orchard I've been to waters daily. They, again, they don't want that plant to have experience dryness, even a hint of dryness. They don't want that. So you don't have to water much. You know, if it looks wet. You don't have to water much, but certainly do not let it dry out. Plants do not like drying out. So. Production plant. So, and one other rule on watering. So you can induce diseases if leaves stay wet. The, the magical time is around four hours. So if you water a leaf, and it stays wet for four hours, not if you just water. It's got to stay wet for about four hours. These, the, uh, the disease spores have to germinate in the droplet of water. It's not moving. I mean, if you keep watering constantly, diseases can't start. But once the watering stops and the water droplets there, if it sits there for more than four hours, you can get a disease from that drop of water uh, from disease spores. So that would tell you, okay, don't water too late in the evening or too early in the morning. Water when you think it can dry out in about four hours. Now, you know, with the weather 80 or 90 degrees, it don't matter, you can water anytime you want. But in spring or fall or winter, yeah, don't water, say, at five in the afternoon. It's going to stay wet till noon the next day. And you can cause some diseases on certain plants disease cone plants if, if it stays wet that way. So of course, you know, you can just you know like Portland Rose Garden. Mm -hmm. What they found is that in the morning if they have dew on the roses, they just turn on the sprinkler. Get that dew off of there. It's pretty warm in Portland. Uh, they're almost like riverside or they're essentially like riverside. So so they'll water them and then they'll dry off immediately, but they want to get that dew off when they found if they watered every morning for just two minutes with sprinklers, they can, that got, you know, got rid of bugs and got rid of a lot of the diseases the roses got. So that, that really helps. Okay. Off and Chris, we're back. Now we'll start with the Chris. And now the one thing to know about fertilizers, and we gave you a sheet here that has the, the numbers on it is that when you fertilize the plants, 
it's not like when we eat food. It's it's totally different. So we eat food, and the food gives us energy. When you give plants fertilizer, you're not giving them energy. So if you have a plant that's really weak, and you throw a whole bunch of fertilizer on it, you're making your plant weaker because plants get their energy from the sun, and they turn into sugar with photosynthesis. The fertilizer you're giving them are building materials for, for the plant to make a bigger plant, but it's not making the plant stronger. So you have to make sure you get to your mind, just because the plant is pale and green doesn't mean that it's weak. It just means it doesn't have these minerals in it to make it greener. But if you know if, if you you know if you have a plant that's in shock, you don't don't suddenly throw a whole bunch of fertilizer expecting to get stronger. It's got to be in the sun, absorbing the sunlight to get stronger as so, well. Um, so this is the breakdown of the minerals in a plant. <laughs> So plants are like animals, like us. They're mostly carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. That's percentage. And, and generally, we don't have to add these uh, because when we water it, that's in water and the carbon is in carbon dioxide in the air. So those things, we don't have to worry about adding. Uh, the nitrogen is pretty important. So nitrogen in plants is their membranes on animals. It's our skin and hair and all the membranes in our body are made out of nitrogen. Plants, the cell membranes and nucleus of plants are made out of nitrogen. Uh, most of the plant, though, is carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. So sugar molecules are that. Cellulose, which is the wood of a plant, is this rearranged, we can't eat it. So wood, this is the wood, this piece of wood, that's sugar. The only thing that can eat cellulose is bacteria. So all the plants that eat supposedly eat wood, like beavers and termites, they have to have this bacteria in the stomach that can change cellulose back into sugar. And you don't want to be a beaver. Beavers eat the wood, the bacteria breaks it down and gets the sugars out, and then they excrete it, and then they have to eat it again. Don't want to be a beaver. <laughs> to, get, to get the sugars, they have to eat their wood twice. Anyway, uh, it's potassium. 1%. The potassium in animals and plants does the same thing. It's the it's the salt that balances our fluids. So your blood salt is potassium. It doesn't have anything in particular to do. It's well, it does um, help your nerves stop firing. So if you don't have enough potassium, you kind of get jittery. Uh, but potassium in plants is the juice of the plants. It's also the juice of fruit. So you want bigger fruit, juicier fruit. You need that potassium. Uh, then phosphorus is the energy storing molecule. So, in, if you took um, biochemistry and took biochemistry in college, uh, there's molecules called ATP, ADP, the adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate. That's how plants and animals move energy from sugar to their muscles. So when you break down sugar, you are powering up phosphorus and you're making this bigger molecule. And this molecule goes to them, say to your muscles, and powers that muscle, then it turns back, it loses the phosphorus molecule. So anyway, phosphorus is involved in the transfer of energy. Now, unfortunately, our our industry keeps saying simple things like you need a lot of phosphorus to make flowers and fruits and roots. Well, it's not that necessary, but you need it. But you need all these things. There's all these minerals you need. So don't just 
look at one thing and thinks you need a whole bunch of it just because it's involved in energy transfer. It, it doesn't really make any sense. Um, now, calcium, so these are the big three nutrients we usually talk about. Calcium is actually more important, 0.5%. So it's more important than phosphorus. So calcium is involved in the wood of trees. So the woodier the plant, the more calcium has. Most fruit trees need a lot of calcium to make their wood. Calcium is also involved in finishing fruit. Uh, got quite a few other things going on with calcium. So these are the what are called the major nutrients here. These are the main things that are made out of it. And then the minor nutrients. Which you need very little of would be uh, magnesium, sulfur, iron, chlorine, manganese, boron, zinc, copper, molybdenum, nickel, cobalt. And you can see by the numbers, you don't need much of this uh, 0.2. 0 0.1, 0 0.01. There is a, you know, in the industry for about 20 years, we really centered on iron as being a major problem. Like 0 0.01, it's not that major. They say as long as your soil is acidic enough and your roots are healthy, you've got enough iron. Yeah, the one of the main problems we have is if the roots aren't healthy, they're not picking up the micronutrients. See, so if you have plants and growing in compost, they have all these nutrient deficiencies because they just can't pick them up. And once you get this, them into better soil, suddenly they're just green. So that's one of the problems we have. It's not that the plants are missing iron, it's just that they are almost dead and they can't pick up. The nutrients properly. So those are all essential nutrients. Now we think there's another one, silica. Uh, plants have shown to be sturdier if they have silica in them. I mean, no one ever thought there would be a, a nutrient you need because the silica. But once they started growing plants in hydroponics and and in total soilless mediums like compost, suddenly knows, hey, plants need silica. Let's spray silica on them. Well, what the heck? Just throw them in real dirt. But uh, our industry is really crazy there. Now, most of these micronutrients, they're called, um, are needed in either enzymes that do certain processes in the plant, or a lot of these are actually part of the chlorophyll molecule. So if the chlorophyll molecule can't form, your plant's not as green as it should be. So a lot of these things, man, you know, magnesium, iron, uh, manganese, boron, zinc, copper, a lot of those, if they're missing, your plant's yellow. Because it can't make the chlorophyll molecule. So all more needed. Now, the main thing to know is well, what what fertilizer has all this stuff in it? Well, a dead leaf does. So in nature, generally, all the nutrition are the pile of dead leaves on top of the ground. Of course, there's animal manure in there too, and there's some twigs and some flower petals. But dead leaves are primarily, you know, they're they said in nature, on average, five inches of dead stuff on top of the ground. I mean, we noted that there's some areas where there's five foot of dead leaves on the ground. Of course, you go to the desert, there's hardly anything on the ground. So it ranges, but five inches of dead stuff on top of the ground is the average. What we've been told is the average throughout the world. So that's your nutrient layer in your soil is 
the duff it's called the duff the ufl so the problem we have is on modern foreign techniques they can't handle up on the ground because they're they're plowing and doing all this other stuff that's messing up the dirt and the duff would just get in the way so you know so something has to happen with the farming system in the united states they got to change back to either small farms that don't use tractors or something because the they're really messing up the soil every time they put in a crop i mean there are some new farmers that know this stuff that are doing this but most of the big farms um still do the you know the operation where they throw away everything whole old crop they throw it away send it all to the dump and then they till the soil they have to put the nutrients back in because it's all in the dump now and they start over in every every new crop whereas you know the newer generation of farmers being taught you can't do this anymore you got to have some other way of, of farming so if you don't have dead leaves available and dead leaves again the nutrition from the dead well so the way Nutrition is cycled in nature. So see, you have this plant here. The roots are in here in the soil. You have your duff layer on top of the ground. So in nature, the 95% of all plant species use a fungi to recycle their crops called a mycorrhizal fungus. They only discovered this around the 1960s. They had to use electron microscopes because they thought all these little root hairs on the test to this plant was part of the plant. And they discovered, I think it's a fungus. It's actually a fungus that's attached to our plants. And this fungus goes up into the duff layer, eats up those leaves, breaks them down, pulls the nutrients, the mineral nutrients back into the, the plant it's attached to in as little as 90 days after a leaf falls on the ground the nutrients came back into the plant so that's what the, this fungus does uh it's a symbiotic partner on plants that's been around since plants went from the ocean to the land because the plant roots couldn't eat the rocks on the land the fungus could do that so they partnered up the fungus gets cellulose and sugar from the plant to make its body and in return, the plants gets all the minerals that are broken down when the when the fungus eats up the uh, vegetable matter. There is some energy you can get out of dead vegetable matter too, but that it's a good symbiotic relationship that ninety five percent of plants have. The few plants that don't, um, certain grasses can get by without it. And one family of vegetables that's well known, uh, the cabbage broccoli family. So the sacee, cabbage broccoli, cauliflower. They have roots that can do what uh, the mycorrhizal fungus can do, or they have roots that gather nutrients in the soil really well. Can I ask you about the, the, like your avocado, what the uh, dry avocado leaves? They can reduce. Like moringa and all that dries and other would be equal. Yeah. Yeah. Most and leaves most leaves have the same nutrients in them. Yeah. So yeah. But the plants love their own leaves. I mean, that's one reason they're a tree and they drop their leaves straight down is because they want to get the nutrients right back out of their leaves. I mean, in the old days they said the avocado orchards would clear all the leaves off, hoping to prevent root rot. And then they found out with study research that the chemical coming out of the decomposing leaves actually prevents root rot. So they were told, oh, put all your leaves back in your tree. Go take them away. Yes. In the garden, you don't, normally you don't have ducks. You can should you put some leaves between your rows or oh, yeah. then, then when you clear it off and start a new one and put new leaves or how do you do that? Hold on, you just keep on adding. So these leaves break down really fast. I mean, uh, you know, the nature. Oh yeah, yeah. 
especially if you don't compost first. So we learned about this in the 1980s. So when I had a house in the 90s, we start we stopped using our compost bins. And we just said, okay, let's we're gonna chip up the leaves because it looks prettier, but just throw them underneath the plants. They're gone so fast. It's it's pretty amazing how fast that stuff disappears. So in nature, if it never piles up past five inches, you know it's it's decomposing fast. So yeah. You know, see, so far we just need a straw. Are you saying that you got to say would that be the It's really good, yeah. You want you want to keep the ground covered with something organic. So anyway, in nature, uh, this is how it's done. If you can do it in your yard, so much the better. Now, generally, if you're starting a new yard, you don't have all this stuff. So you have to put on some fertilizers. Um, so among fertilizers, there's different things. Now, in the old days, we just had what, are, what were called simple products. Like we had, I remember my dad had 100 pound bags of blood meal, 100 pound bags of bone meal, and 100 pound bags of cottonseed meal. And that's all used because, in general, especially the cottonseed meal, you know, that's this ground up cottonseeds. You figure, well, the seeds of a plant have everything that new plant needs to grow. So there's nothing missing. They have all those minerals in them ready to go but anything that's dead generally has all the minerals now in the meantime we've learned that bone meal is pretty much useless so we don't push or promote bone meal that much anymore because they said it takes too long to break down you know they said you put bone meal down the original bone meal is made out of cow bones ground up and put it down and maybe maybe five years later you'll get the nutrients out of it so uh, blood meal is real quick source of nitrogen the first number it's got other numbers in it too but they're too low so it's mostly nitrogen oh, okay so the second thing about soils in orange county our native soil here has most of the micronutrients fine it is low in nitrogen which all soils around the world are there's nitrogen unfortunately in the soil is usually either leaches out through the water or it evaporates as ammonia. So it's not, it's not stable. Phosphorus is very stable. In general, we have about twice as much in the ground as the plant needs. So if you're planting in the ground or if you're planting in soil in a raised bed, you should not have to add any phosphorus. We have about twice as much as, as you would normally need. Uh, every, uh, potassium, we don't have quite enough. We have it in there, you could use more. Um, now, the other thing you know about most of these minerals is that they stick to soil pretty good. Other than nitrogen, they stick pretty good. So if you add them constantly, you start building up the numbers and a lot of them pretty high. The nitrogen never builds up. It's always either evaporating or even leached out. But the other numbers can build up on you. So be careful with that. So, you know, one of the uh, stupid things our industry has said a while ago, back in the 80s, I think, they said if the numbers are all equal, like 15, 15, 15, it's a balanced fertilizer. Well, that's not, because in plant, these numbers should be three, one, two ratio, not a one, one, one ratio. The nitrogen versus phosphorus versus potassium should be this ratio, not that ratio. So, and if you keep on adding this after a few years, these two numbers, especially this number, gets really high in your ground. And the main thing they we've been told is that if you build up too much water soluble phosphorus in the soil, you wipe out your mycorrhizal fungus. And the mycorrhizal fungus, one of its main things it's good at is picking up the phosphorus. So if you raise the phosphorus too high, it just burns up that that um, symbiotic organism because it's just too much. So we, you know, you can use this once or twice your current, but don't keep using numbers that are that high in phosphorus. That can really, so there's out there, there's a 20, 20, 20, a 15, 15, 15, 10, 10, 10. Uh, I mean, you know, your plants look really good when you use them once, just don't keep it up. 
Back in the old days, Miracle Grow was 15, 30, 15s. Because they look so good when you put that much phosphorus on them. Because phosphorus has a hard time getting the plant, especially in potting soil, that's totally artificial. Um, but they corrected it because I guess they were told in the 80s or 90s, that's really bad. So now they're, I think they're more like these numbers here. So if you have normal dirt, you put on your, you know, either dead leaves or organic matter, everything's working pretty wood. If you've got new soil that you just brought in, uh, this system may not be set up to break this stuff down very quick, even the organic fertilizers. And so we at our nursery, especially if we're using our potting soils, which are artificial, we get started with a chemical fertilizer like Osmocote. This is a time release, 15, 9, 12. So it's not perfect ratio, but it's close. What's that, a uh, 5, 3, 4 ratio? Not too bad. This is the most widely used fertilizer in nurseries in the U.S. for good reason. They have, of the other, of, of the list of minerals, that's 17 plus one minerals that plants made out of. Generally, 13 you have to apply. They're, they may not be there, but especially in our pine soils, they're probably not there. Well, that's not true. We have pumice in there. Pumice and peat both have some of the micros in them. But anyway, this has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 11 minerals. And I haven't seen any other chemical fertilizers with more than 11. So this has uh, as many as you're gonna find. Um, this Romer one, yeah, this got 10, that's pretty close. Got eight. Now this is interesting. So this is a chemical fertilizer that was created for Rose Hills, right there in Whittier. So the chemist working on this, you know, was a rose guy too. So he wanted to make a fertilizer perfect for rose hills. So he analyzed the soil and the water and said, this is what you need to fertilize the rose with to have all the minerals. So it is pretty specific to Orange County. What year is that in LA County? Yeah. Okay. Close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is pretty accurate. So it is, and it is made for specifically for roses. So have a unique fertilizer we can get. Um, now they did a study um, because nurses were being, you know, were being warned that they were going to be blamed for polluting the groundwater in the U.S. So they did a study with nurseries using osmocote to see how much was getting out of the pot and into the soil. I think they came up with uh, eight percent, which which surprised everybody. They thought they thought it'd be really high. They said, you know, it takes three months for a nursery to grow a plant, and the, so three months later, uh, a little bit had evaporated into the air. Um, Sixty percent was either in the plant or in the soil still in this form, and they had lost a little bit into the groundwater. I think it was like eight percent. It wasn't much. They're expecting more like 30% of the nitrogen to be in the groundwater. And they they said it didn't happen. So so apparently the nursery industry did this research to tell the EPA go look somewhere else. Because they and most nurseries now, most wholesalers, they recycle all their wastewater. Everything's grown on plastic now, and they put it in big ponds and recycle it. So uh, nursery industry apparently is not responsible for polluting the groundwater. Farms generally are the main culprits. In the old days, we used stuff like ammonium sulfate, but uh, which is real quick working, but it just flushes right through, so we don't use that much more. Um, organics are better. Uh, these. Single things like this, if you just put 
2100 on your plants for a few years, you'll run into other nutrient problems because you're only putting on one nutrient. So it's better to stay organic. The uh, soil and plant lab in Anaheim, which is the farmer's aids in Orange County, you can take soil samples to them. They can analyze what's in your soil. You can take leaf samples. You know, that's what farms used to do. Send a leaf sample to the lab and they'll tell them what you need to add to your water or your soil to make the plants grow. Uh, they told me that, you know, it's really hard to tell what minerals are missing in plant by sight because they're always getting these leaves and they bet each other what's in there and what's missing and they always get it wrong. I said, it's really hard for us. It's pretty much impossible for a homeowner. They said, if you stay organic, you stay in the ballpark. You start trying to figure it out with the chemical fertilizers, you can go way off one direction or the other and really get messed up. So that's good. If, if you want to promote the food production, the best thing is more depth, right? Well, water, water's water. If you, once you have all the nutrients in place, water is the most important thing. Bees are important too. So bees yeah, and so water, right? But, but I mean, to get the food to pollinate, you know, to get the, the buds? Well, to get the flower buds, the plant, okay, so when plants bloom, usually they have enough energy stored in them to do that. They have to have that energy. If they don't have enough energy stored from the previous year, they're not going to flower. Uh, okay, that, that opens up that door here. So there is, so minerals are all involved in Build, as building materials, essentially. But we found out 40 years ago that plants will absorb sugar. It's kind of weird, but plants do absorb sugar. It kind of makes sense that they do, but it's kind of weird that they can do that. So 30 years ago, we saw an article in the California Red Food Stores magazine talking about molasses. So they said, okay, we have some members of the rare fruit growers that live in Paul's Verde, so high there, their citrus have never flowered. Just too cloudy. You can't get the trees can't get enough energy. So they, some of those members looked in the books and they want to see if there's any kind of sugar that they're, that's been used on plants. And they found an article in a college research paper back east saying that, yeah, the least plants of are molasses. They came up with this formula of molasses, fish emulsion, and seaweed extract um, that they can spray onto plants. It was actually the original article was to get these cuttings to grow. They had these hardwood cuttings that they were trying to root and grow, and they said there just wasn't enough energy in them to finish the roots. There wasn't enough sugar stores to finish the roots. So they wanted to make sure these cuttings grew. Well, the seaweed is like a kick in the rear. It's growth hormones. The fish is actually nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that the plant might need to grow. And then the molasses is the energy source. And essentially the formula for this was one ounce of each of a gallon of water. We want to allow out of each of those items. And they also put in boric acid so that it would kill the ants that tried to eat this stuff. Uh, we don't use the boric acid. Boric acid is real nasty on certain plants. They don't like that boric acid. So we just put these three together and spray it on the leaves of plants. So whenever we spray plants for anything, we just add those to them. Because we've seen how it works. So... The first year I tried this back in the 80s, I had an orange tree that never produced fruit. I had it for about five years around, and it was looked really good. It was a blood orange and never fruited. So I sprayed it in the fall six times, like I said, every two weeks in the fall. And the next year I had 200 oranges. But and I said, well, you might have been ready to fruit anyway. So the year after that, I had a plum tree that was making about five plums per branch over the whole tree. I said, okay, what if I just spray one branch? So I sprayed one branch six times that fall. The next year, that one branch had 28 plums. I'm going, this seems to work. <laughs> so from that point on, every time we spray plants, you know, so in the spring and summer, plants are just programmed to grow. So you spray this on them, they just grow. 
They grow bigger leaves. Everything about them is bigger, more vigorous. Uh, it doesn't take the substitute of regular fertilizer. You need this too. This is just like icing on the cake. So we've had some people say, well, this is what I'm using. Plant's not doing anything. It's not enough. It's just an extra boost of energy, but you need your regular fertilizer schedule. But you put this on on top of that, they do a little extra for you. And we found out that those guys who grow those little bucket pumpkins will tell you that they can't break 500 pounds unless they're doing this. You can do it as often as you want. You do it when it's more humid time of day, so early morning, late evening. Uh, the article said every two weeks. But uh, you can do way more than that even every day if you want. I'm sure those guys who grow those little worker pumpkins have to do a lot. I mean, you know, they're, you know, they're up to 2,000 pounds now. And they said they can't break 500 without, quote, cheating. <laughs> so. so for avocado, you do that, but then what do you for the like? This one is good. That's got a lot of calcium in it, more calcium than anything else in here, which avocados like, 8% calcium. So this is, you know, perfect for avocados. Is that on top of the leaves that you're putting all your avocado leaves on the bottom? To keep it yeah, you just leave the avocado leaves. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, if it's a new yard, you don't have anything there yet, so you have to add something. But if you just put a whole bunch of leaves in the ground, that's got essentially the same stuff in it. It's nice to have chickens too. Apparently, all the farms that are self sustaining have chickens. <laughs> Chicken poop is really nutritious stuff. You know, they don't say on the bags what's in it, but apparently it's very nutritious. So, so if you have the leaves on the chickens, then you can. Do this way. Mm -hmm. And as long as you got a lot of, you know, you got this much leaf down there, you got a lot of fertilizer. So they did analyze, they analyzed um, conventional farms versus organic farms that have a lot of leaf litter on the ground. They said they're amazing. The organic farms showed more nutrition available than the chemical farms, which doesn't surprise us, but they were astounded that the trees, you know, had had more nutrition the old fashioned way, just dead leaves on the ground than they did when they actually applied them. So. We have a farmer tree that gave us so much stuff. Sure. I'm sure your guava wants their own leaves, though. There's been so much stuff. Yeah. And they don't become both exactly the same, though. They just Oh, so, well, you have to pile them up and keep them moist. You keep them moist, they they go really fast. Because I mean, we were, you know, we in our backyard, we were just leaving all the leaves in the backyard. It wasn't getting very deep. We went, you know, we try not to throw anything away on our trees, and we were still just like this on the ground. We and it never piled up that deep. I mean, I threw everything underneath my avocado tree. You know, clipping my hedges, threw them underneath that. Our country is still only this deep. I couldn't get the height any higher than that. They decompose too fast. What about pine needles? That's fine. Pine needles are very popular in the deep south. They have so many pine trees down there. You just put them on everything. Well, I put about five inches of dust in the pot with my avocado tree. Two weeks it was down to it. <laughs> I mean, it, it just decomposed. But then the trees are doing really good. And part of that is just all that stuff. Yeah. You know, because I've got a reed avocado tree, and what I do is I'm keeping it, you know, about 10 feet tall. So I just cut the stuff on top and then cut all the leaves off and just disperse it over all my avocado trees. And and they, they love that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and then, like you said, all the other plants, I put their, their duck under this too. I can't get enough in there. Yeah, some, <laughs> somebody has to retrain all the gardeners, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and homeowners too. Okay, so.
the duff is important to uh, mulches. So if you don't have any duff, you know, some kind of mulch on the ground. So the mulches and the duff layer keep the roots cool too. So temperature is important. They, they know if you have bare soil in the ground and it's 90 degrees and sunny, the ground one foot deep where your deepest roots are is like 120 degrees. It's just too high. Roots don't like to be above 85, 86. So in Texas, they did a research. They put three inches of mulch on top of their orchards. One foot deep was only in the 80s. So that three inches of mulch really keeps the ground cool. There's the other thing that was found in Texas back in the 1980s when they had a real bad drought is that a real thick layer of duff can condense moisture out of the air. So, um, so you generate water when you have a really deep duff layer. They also discovered that up in the state of Washington, they have some farms up there. Who, they said stop watering in the 1980s when they found out if they just covered their orchard foot and half deep with duff, they wouldn't have the water. So, so that helps too that way. And with our humidity this year, you'll probably create water. <laughs> So anything that's a, any cooler at night than the daytime creates that condensation. In Texas, they said they had all these dead plants on the highways. They chipped them all up, piled them on the side of the highway. That side of the highway greened up, and they couldn't figure it out. It was the middle of the drought, and it's still greened up on one side. Okay. Yeah. So the last major topic is crop rotation, which is also known as the replant syndrome. So some not so intelligent people, while well, not, I would just say, ignorant people would tell you that they rotate crops because each crop takes out nutrients that you can't replace. Well, that's not true because we know what all the nutrients are and any of these things have all the nutrients in them. So what's the problem is that each crop leaves behind dead parts of itself that it doesn't like anymore. So in nature, uh, there's not, no such thing as a monoculture system unless there's wildfire. So in nature, the only thing that can clean the soil up, sterilize the soil, is a wildfire. So wildfires, you know, the hot forest fires, um, they said that heat doesn't penetrate the ground that deep, but it goes a good eight, eight inches or so in the ground and just incinerates all the roots of the trees. So in temperate North America, you can have a wildfire that burns all the, let's say the fir trees down. And because the ground has been sterilized, the fir trees will grow back. If it doesn't burn down, they can't grow back. And that's one of the problems they've had in Yosemite is that the original trees at the, they said at the entrance of Yosemite have been there now for 100 years and they're so sick, they're all dying. They said, we gotta let this thing burn, but they can't. People don't like it to let the whole part of the assembly burned down, but they said all the trees are dying from old age. They, they can't help it. Uh, they gotta let that thing burn so the trees can grow back healthy again. So, um, so if, they, if they don't let them burn, something else grows. Pines will grow, oaks will grow, uh, because they don't care about the dead body of the fir tree there. So in like in the Amazon jungle, generally, well, what's left of it, there are no fires because it's too wet there. So they said that even though in the Amazon everything looks so high, you know, all the jungle trees look like, it said that the average distance between trees of the same type, 70 yards, uh, it's 170 yards. It's a big distance. You'll have this one beech tree here and football field away, you'll have another, another one there because they can't grow near each other. Once one dies, that whole area is, is no good for starting a new tree of that type. So they have hundreds and hundreds of species of trees growing in, in the Amazon just because they, they can't grow in the same spot again. 
whereas we have mono forests in temperate climates where you have forest fires. So, but you have to have that forest fire to keep that forest looking good, or else uh, you know they have all these sick trees after a while that are dying from old age. So plants die. Well, okay. So one reason trees die. So they claim that, well, like in the redwood forest, the healthy trees look like this. And what they have to do for a redwood to stay healthy, it's got to keep growing a bigger root system every year in all directions. As long as it can do that, it can maintain its full health and still grow. Once it reaches its maximum size and can't support a bigger root system, then the redwood tree starts looking like, like that. And it starts to decline. And then when it's on its way out, they said they die relatively quickly. You know, maybe you know, they're healthy for four or 5,000 years, but they die within 100 or 200 years because they, they, they exceeded the health of their root system, so they just die. So that happens in to the redwood trees. They stay like this while they're healthy, and then they start looking otherwise as they max out and then start declining, and then they die relatively fast. And then it may take you know two or three decades before the roots decompose and they can start growing again. So there is this research project I saw University of Arizona did, these grad students. They're thinking, well, in the Arizona climate, it's so extreme. There's got to be a place where there's only one plant that is that lives there, the plant that's perfectly adapted, but they couldn't find it. They said, we can't find any ecosystems in Arizona in these canyons, these desert canyons, where there's only one plant that dominates. And apparently, they didn't know about the replant syndrome. So they said, yeah, they're finding that there's cola, chola, or the C-H-O-L-L-A, cola cactus, Choya cactus and mesquite. They they live side by side. When one dies, the other grows. When that one dies, the other grows. And that's how they have to operate in that ecosystem. Those are two highly well adapted plants of the ecosystem, but there can't be just one because when one gets old, the other one thrives. So the other one takes over. So you have to have at least two plants in any ecosystem. So on farms, you know, hundreds of years ago, or even thousands of years ago now. They found out that if they grew the same crop every year, it wasn't as good. So they started doing it every other year and they kept going. So the farm, when we got this dirt off of the farmer there told me they're on a 10 crop rotation cycle. And we were there for four years. Four years, we never saw them put the same crop in the same patch of land. So they're on at least a four year rotation cycle where they grow 10 different crops over a four year period, and then they plant the same crop again. And that's to avoid all the disease that build up after the last crop. Now you've seen some farms, especially on the freeways, where they plant the same strawberries every year, every year, every year, and they're sterilizing the soil in between. So they have to get rid of all the organisms that are eating up the old strawberry roots by fumigation. Now there's less and less fumigants available. So those people are gonna be gone you know, another 10 years, you won't find any farmers doing that anymore. They'll be rotating their crops like the other farmers do uh, on a, you know, on this 10 crop rotation cycle. So, uh, and they, you know, this, I asked the farmer, well, why do you grow cabbage? Why do you grow this? Because, you know, they can't make any money on that stuff. They said, yeah, it's, it's part of the rotation cycle. They only grow those crops, cabbage, uh, beans. They, they can't make any money on them at all. But they want to get back to their strawberries, which makes all their money for it. So we grow strawberries. We can really do well. I had relatives that were strawberry farmers in the 1960s in Cerritos. And when they had a good year, back in the 60s, they, they said they cleared 50 grand. All the kids bought houses. They no longer are farmers. <laughs> they don't have to be. But, uh, you know, that, that's the... Nowadays, the most expensive crop in the world, the most money-making crop is, is marijuana, but strawberries is still up there. So they do everything to grow strawberries. So if you have your own garden, you want to have at least, I would say, three separate beds. Four is better. So you can rotate from year to year to year to year to year before you go back to the same one again.
course, it's important to have permanent soil. Don't buy anything in for your raised beds called topsoil, garden soil, anything that anyone else sells called topsoil is not really dirt. Most topsoils we've seen are maybe half this and half manure, or half this and half something else. Uh, way too rich. When the uh, University of California went around in the year 2000, they wanted they checked up on the farmers. They wanted to see, make sure the organic content of the farms was maintaining at about, well, back in uh, 1950 when they did the first test, they wanted to see what nature had in it. 0.9% organic matter in the farm soils. They went back in 2000, checked again, the farm soils came out at 1.1% organic matter. So that's essentially, you know, essentially it's zero. Uh, but they said the farm's doing a good job at 1.1%. So they said they're, they're fine. So what about bird gardens? Is there any difference? It's got to rotate with that. So some plants, uh, can get by with less rotation. Well, just so you know, I went out back we learned about all this stuff. We wanted to see how it affected tomatoes. So I use tomatoes in the same spot over and over and over. First year, of course, 100% crop. Second year, it wasn't so bad. It was like 80% of the crop. The plant turned yellow before the end of the year. Third year, hardly got a thing. Maybe one or two fruits off of the plant. Uh, so then, you know, you can grow tomatoes there for four more years. So, yeah. rosemary, I thought pretty hard to basil. Well, we noticed that when they use basil as ground cover on the hills, that stays good for about 10 years. So it can handle being in the same spot about 10 years. And it just, so plants die again when they, they just fill the ground around them with too many dead roots. So, like in my neighborhood, they had rosemary for 10 years and they had myoporn for 10 years and they had something else. You now every 10 years they had to redo the whole slope because the plants all died. So uh, a lot of the smaller plants, you know, trees live longer because they have bigger root systems, but a lot of these shrubs we use and ground covers we use 10 years about it, unless they don't need have much need for root. Like we've seen ice plant go forever. Well, ice plant has very few roots. So, and grasses generally can, live among the dead for a long time so we you know you notice if you grow grass for the first time it's the most vigorous and over the years it gets less and less vigorous but grasses generally can live in the same spot almost forever pretty much they're, they're very tolerant so things like corn wheat aren't rotated as much but um so uh, a while ago someone sent me so they gave me a book about this farmer in Japan that had started doing sustainable gardening in the 1950s and 60s. And because um, he wanted to get back to, his dad was a farmer, he didn't want to be, so he became a plant pathologist. And, he, and then he, after 10 years of being a pathologist, he goes, you know, most of these diseases are related to the way we farm. So we get, there's got to be another answer. So we went back to his dad's farm and wanted to make the farming as easy as possible. Not necessarily organically, but as easy as he could. And so their main crop was, was barley in the winter and rice in the summer. And he says, you know, um, just leave the plants on the field. So he would grow his rice crop. And they'd harvest the rice, shake it out, and then they'd lay all the rice branches back on the field and then grow the barley in it. And then the barley would use the rice as kind of a cover crop. And then the barley would come up and then uh, they'd harvest the barley and then they'd lay it back down and grow the rice again. They just kept on, they didn't move anything. They tried not to move anything too far off the property. They wanted to keep it all there. Uh, that's only, you know, we don't grow rice, we don't grow barley here. No. <laughs> so. That might be exceptional because they, again, they can handle being in the same ground year after year. Now, what's interesting was we read articles about, I read articles about what was happening up in Sacramento. So in Sacramento, when they grow rice up there, what they were doing back in the 80s, once they harvested the rice crop, they would put all the chaff back in the field and they would torch it. And that way, that would sterilize the ground and get ready for the next year's crop. Well, <clears throat> the city started complaining, so they can't torch anymore. So they started leaving it there. 
and they're having all these problems with their rice crop rotting. And they, they're showing the soil is turning black because it's full of sewer gases. They said, yeah, you can't, I don't know what the result was, what they're doing now instead of uh, you know, burning, but just leaving the dead plants in the water, they're trying to grow new rice on it, uh, disaster. You can't, you can't have that dead rotten body sitting in the water there with your rice. Now, the guy in Japan didn't, didn't flood his fields. He just kept them moist. That probably helped him out. But, um, so they're, you know, they're coming up with these roadblocks to sustainable gardening. Burning would have been better. <laughs> but, uh, now the one thing that they're trying to get farms to do is figure out how to turn their waste crops into charcoal. Because apparently it's charcoal that actually makes the ground nutrition, hold the nutrition better. So in the third world countries, this is standard practice. You go to the Amazon, you go to the Philippines, you go to Vietnam. Once your crop is done, they'll torch it, set it on fire. And then when it's fully en engulfed in flames, they bulldoze over and bury it. So when you're burning and you're extremely hot, no oxygen, instead of going to ash, it turns to charcoal. And charcoal is a inert material. It's, you can still burn it, but it's inert otherwise. Nothing eats charcoal. The charcoal attracts minerals to it like crazy. So if there's any fertilizer in there, it sticks to the charcoal until the plant picks it off. So a little bit of charcoal, they said the National Geographic ran a soil article in the year 2000 saying that the rich black soils of the world are rich and look black because of a charcoal content somewhere between one and 2%. So in our top pot, we, we, you know, we overdid it, we made it 5% charcoal. But they said that little bit of charcoal not only makes soils highly nutritious or retain nutrition, but it makes it look black. Now, what you don't want to do is add, mix a lot of compost into your ground to make it look bad black. But there's a lot of, you know, articles in journal horticultural magazines that, oh, we have a lot of compost around, make it look black. When you do that with compost, it's making sewer gases. Sewer gases are black. That's the problem they had when they had the rice fields flooded with the dead rice plants in it. The soils were all black. They said if we aired it out, the sewer gas escaped to turn back to light brown. But you put compost soil, you make your soil turn black, you killed it. I mean, grass might be living that. Grass plants often live in real black soils through a lot of dead grass plants, but uh, not much else can live in soil that turns black from sewer gases. So be careful with that. Do not, but try not to mix the duff layer on top with the soil below it when you're planting plants. I mean, the place up in Washington that was growing rope, they're also, besides orchards, they're growing row crops. They said they had a foot of duff on the ground. They would move it aside, plant their seedlings in there, then push it back as the plants grew. They said the nice thing about that method, they didn't have to fertilize, didn't have to water, didn't have to weed. Um, so that's that's the um, the nice things about having that much on the ground. Okay. If it's organic, it is. I mean, you can make mulch out of rocks, but yeah. Yeah. So mulch com compost just means it's been decomposing. Of course, you can just chop up a tree and put it down. It's not compost yet, but it is mulch or duh. Yeah. Mulch. That's just a term we use for stuff covering the ground. Because you can have a plastic mulch. Yeah. yeah. They sell plastic mulch, they sell rubber mulch, and all kinds of mulches you can get. But you want, but right, we want an organic mulch. That's that's better. So anyway, rotate your crops well. Um, yeah, what do you do with the tomato plants at the end of the year? Do you get rid of them, or can you cut them back and just let them? Well, if I was living by myself, <laughs> I would just lay them on the ground and leave them. There. Cut them back. Yeah, you can cut them to smaller pieces if you want, and just leave them there. But since I have to live with another person, I have to throw things away. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, that's the thing. We haven't tried it yet. I haven't had the opportunity to try all this stuff. I mean, 
Right now I have some corn stalks laying on the ground. You know, I don't know how long they'll stay there before someone cleans them up. But uh, we'll see what we can do that way. Um, but it's okay to leave it in the ground. Not yeah, as long as you don't plant, you know, as long as it's gone three years later, when you replant your tomatoes or your peppers or your eggplant in the same bin, you don't want them visibly there anymore. Mm -hmm. So they should be gone within that length of time. But they'll grow back. Right, so well, anyway, yeah, so the idea is, is your crops, if you can leave them in place and you grow something else on top of them, uh, we haven't, you know, again, we haven't seen enough, I haven't seen enough articles on that yet. On, uh, on just keeping them in place. Of course, uh, the farms up north that have the deep mulch, they're probably just, you know, adding them to their pile. But, uh, I haven't seen any research on that here. Okay. Some of the important, uh, pest control to use in organic gardening. So we, we prefer not to use chemicals at all, especially if you're going to eat stuff yourself. Um, oh, uh, one last note on this. So we mentioned that there's mycorrhizal fungi in the ground. Now, if you put artificial soil in here, like our top pot or asmix, which has been buried in a either in a lake or a pond or in the ground for you know, you know at least decades, there's no mycorrhizal fungus. Most of the organic fertilizers by Doctor Earth have the mycorrhizal fungus added. Um, you can also buy little packages of mycorrhizal fungus. It's just like you're not giving the soil. It's a little bit. It's all you need. And then it uh, connects with your plants, and then it multiplies itself real fast. Uh, back in the 90s, some reports said this stuff was all snake oil because it was throughout nature. Well, there are instances, you know, if you bring in a pile of sand and grow plants in it, you don't know where that sand came from. It was from the surface? Was it very deep? Uh, it may not have the mycorrhizal fungus in it yet, so you might want to add it. Uh, our top pot and our acid mix may not have any mycorrhizal fungi in them, so you might want to add it. Uh, most plants don't care which mycorrhizal fungus they uh, they encounter. So, like this has uh, 20 different, now yeah, maybe not quite 20, 15 different kinds of mycorrhizal fungus spores in here. Um, but often, just one type gets going and becomes the king of your garden. Okay, some of the pest controls that we want to use now. Um, the most important thing in a garden, keep the ants out of it. So Argentine ants, which are not native here, uh, have this nasty thing where they farm aphids, mealybugs, bugs, white fly on your plants. So that's their job in nature. The aphids meaty bug, scale, and white fly, they suck on plants, their excrement is sugar water. So the plants are like dairy farmers. They're herding their aphids around onto your most succulent growing plants and keeping away the ladybugs, the lace wings, all the good bugs that want to eat them, they're shooting them away. So if the ants are in your garden, you got bug problems. Um, so with ants, the organic methods aren't as quick. We, I think we're out of our organic one right now. Yeah. The organic one, we've had been having trouble with, um, man, the, I don't know, like I said, the factory that makes it, we've been having trouble getting it from Florida to here. So we don't have, we're not well stocked in that. And it's a slow working system. The fast one would be some of the baits that are out there. Um, so the baits, in fact, even the organic bait, you don't have to put them where you're growing your plants. You can put this anywhere else and still find it. So this is one of the baits that are real effective. It's cornmeal and uh, vegetable oil, which is a favorite among ants. It gives them, you know, uh, protein and carbohydrates. Uh, but it's got a real low dose of a, uh, selecting poison. So you, scatter this around or put it in containers for the ants and take it out of, and they'll take it back to the nest. They've got three days, then it kills the whole colony at one time. Uh, this is Amdro. You saw it? We saw it, we have it on the shelf. There's quite a few different products that do the same thing. They're cornmeal and, and the vegetable bait, 
mixed with a different type. So there's different kinds of slow acting coys they use. The one in here is called uh, hydromethylenon, but they have uh, other ones that are um, also birth control. So they'll make the queen non sterile, which is another way of doing it. So there's different methods they have. I don't have access to more than one product from our suppliers. Uh, Orange County Farm Supply and Orange has probably two or three different modes of, of baits. So, you know, you can use one one year, you use one then different one the next year. And these cornmeal baits, you keep them on the shelf for two or three months, they, the corn gets stale, they don't like it anymore. So make sure you keep buying fresh stuff now and then. It seems to get less effective the longer it's on the shelf. Um, so that, even though that's not organic. Now, one of our dog owners just called up the company and asked him how much of this it would take to kill his 25 pound dog. So they told him he would have to eat about two pounds to get enough poison, which is uh, more than one of these. It might be like three of these. So generally, you know, you don't have to put this little treat uh, medium sized yard, the whole yard, and you can scatter it on your lawn. You can scatter it in your neighbor's yard and the green belt. Um, in our last house, we lived on the cul-de-sac and it was nasty. I mean, this is back in the 1990s before we had that material. And, you know, you had the rivers of ants ranging your house this wide. We just couldn't believe it. And then that stuff, well, wasn't that exact brand, uh, came out from the East Coast because we got the fire ants here at that time. And we put it out twice that year. And our neighborhood, the whole neighborhood said, we haven't seen ants for 20 years. Yeah. We apparently, especially Argentine ants, work in super colonies. So apparently we had to put out enough to kill the whole neighborhood super colony and then it didn't come back for the next 20 years. No one saw an ant. So, uh, yeah, the they said don't water for three hours after you put it down. You want three hours for the ants to be able to pick it up. And generally, ants are most active between April and November. So, you know, you don't put it at, don't waste it in January that they're not out. And it killed, pretty much kills any kind of ant. I was surprised that the native black carpenters, little, little big ones, also farm aphids. I was, I was thinking they're just collect, you know, just like the harvest ants, they collect things. But I noticed that they were farming aphids on some trees. And I know this is weird. So, Apparently, the native carpenter ants aren't good either. What about diatomaceous earth? It works. I don't know how well it works outside versus because when I had ants inside an apartment and bring it up there, I had some diatomaceous earth. So, diatomaceous earth is equivalent to like it's, it's, it's skeleton silica dioxide skeletons of diatoms in the sea. And they act like big shards of glass around us. So with with ants, see ants are so small that they are, their bodies would dehydrate immediately if they weren't covered with wax. So if they walk over diatomaceous earth, supposedly the little the little uh, glass particles scrape off the wax in their joints, and they dehydrate within a day. And when I used it in my apartment, it certainly worked. I had ants come through the carpet. I sprinkled the carpet. No more ants. Uh, when I lived in Texas, you know, I lived in this apartment in Texas, and when you turn on the lights at night, you see the whole kitchen go. Oh. You know, you, you'd find them crawling you on at night. You know, and, and I put some diatomaceous syrup sprinkled underneath my refrigerator, not knowing that there was a fan underneath there, and it spread it over the entire <laughs> apartment. And my manager was just amazed. She goes, you know, you have no no roaches here in the apartment at all. This is really weird. <laughs> he hadn't seen that before. So I told him about the diatomaceous earth. You know, 20 years ago, they said, well, diatomaceous earth might be like asbestos and may cause cancer. And now they've taken that off. They said, no, nah, it doesn't cause cancer. So um, it's just quirks. Well, asbestos is not that different, but it's a highly irritating uh, shaped mineral kind of hook like. So anyway, um, we sell diatomaceous earth, so it might work. 
Uh, although if you put it on dirt, it might just get mixed with the dirt and be in effect. And if you, I think if you water dye to make some sort of once, it probably just gets, it's gone. It's just too small a particle. So, but it works well on hard surface, hard dry surfaces. Um, the most important products that we use um, in organic farming, well, there's a couple of them. So one is Spinosad. These two brands are all popular. So, Spinosad is a chemical that was found made by a bacteria in a rum distillery. So, apparently, it's been in rum in the past. So, people have been drinking Spinosad for hundreds of years. They found it in a rum distillery in the Caribbean islands. So, they gave it the Captain Jack's name, one of the first ones out. But, um, Spinosad kills um, chewy insects plus thrips. It says spider mites. I'm not in agreement that it kills spider mites, but chewy insects and thrips. Thrips uh, are one of the worst creatures that have come into the West lately, especially one called a chili thrip. Uh, right now, most people's roses are all browning. The buds are brown and the new growth is browning out. And they think it's the heat. Well, the chili thrips do that. They, like all new growth on almost any plant you can think of, this new growth, the, they lay, each chili thrip would lay 10, 20 eggs. They all hatch out real fast. They start sucking on the cells of this new growth, real tender new growth. And it just dehydrates. You got so many holes in this new growth, it just dehydrates. So it just turns gray, brown, shrivels up. You don't get any flower buds on your roses, shrivels up the top leaves of, of anything growing fast, like chili plants. Uh, so it came from, and they're real small. So the only way, you know, people bring in branches of roses and, and you can't see them at all. So you just take a piece of white paper and you slap that branch in the white paper, and then you can see all these things. That smaller than a sliver walking around. So one person brought me a branch of the rose this long that was kind of grayish brownish. I slept on there and at least 20 little things walking around. So they're they're small. But uh Spinosad kills them quite well. And unfortunately it kills 95%. So if you only use Spinosad more than a couple times, the population you have left are immune. So that's why we have other products too. Um, so we have the essential oil products or the oil products like neem oil, uh, citrus oil, and then a variety of oils and the doctor final stop. This has um, rosemary oil, sesame oil, peppermint oil, thyme oil, cinnamon oil, and garlic oil. This one is uh, citric acid. And some soap. And this is neem seed oil. And we're hoping that even though these aren't very good on thrips, that they'll kill the 5% that that does. It. Otherwise, you have to use a regular conventional poison, which we'd rather not use in organic garden. So we're hoping by using this one week and that the next, if you have a bad chili thrip problem, that you'll keep them under pretty good control. Is the leaf miner considered a chili? Yes. Very good job on leaf miners. Now we're hearing the stenosad soap now because the Captain Jacks is not sticking to waxy leaf plants very well. So if you have a citrus leaf or say a rose bud, this just doesn't stick without a soap to it. This already has a soap in it. So it's sticking better than this. So this costs more, but um, you know, this if you add maybe three drops of dish soap to it, it might make up for the fact it doesn't have soap in it. Is it better to spray the bottom of it? That's a bad height to spray it. Well, hopefully with the soap added, you get good coverage. It just kind of films around the whole thing, but yeah, it's nice to cover both sides. So we have both of these in, application things that you attach your hose and blast away. So I'm, I'm really liking this, the soap one, you just attach your hose, blast your whole yard. 
with that one. And then these come in the same way. You can put them on a hose and just go at it. So um, all of these, well, this one, these say you have to wait like one day on, um, I don't know, for some reason you have to wait three days on peaches before you can pick them. But uh, tomatoes, you can harvest it the next day. And most of the uh, vegetables, and lettuce, cabbage, you can spray the next day, the next day after you spray it. Plus, you know, I looked at my dog's flea tablets, like 45% spinosad. So apparently it's safe to give to your pets. You can give them this tablet. They eat spinosad and it kills all the fleas on the outside of their body. My dog doesn't act drunk, but, <laughs> you know, the spinosad chemical is very much like alcohol, some kind of alcohol thing. So. Yeah, this is real important veterinary medicine right now. So anyway, these two materials are quite important. Um, we liked this when we first got it. So uh, we had always heard that vinegar killed weeds really well, but the vinegar at the store never did anything because it was only 5% vinegar. <laughs> so we found this 30% vinegar. Let's just make sure if you put in a sprayer, you get a chemical resistant sprayer because a lot of sprayers after about a week with vinegar on them, all the plastic parts dissolved. So, uh, so vinegar you spray it on, especially on if you have a, a vegetable bed and all these little weed seedlings come up, you can spray with vinegar. The only thing we caution don't do this more than a couple times a year because uh, vinegar is highly acidic and uh, it will eventually change your pH so much that your plants may not grow too well. <laughs> But it's way safer than most weed killers. So. Now it is potent. I mean, if you get a whiff of the vapors off of this, it'll clean your your sinuses really well. It is strong. So, and even though it's natural, be careful. <laughs> there are other um, acids that they're using for weed killing that are supposed to be organic. I, th I just think vinegar is more natural than some of the other names that they're throwing at us that are supposed to be supposedly organic acids that are safe to use that may not change the pH as much. So we might have those more in the future, other acids that uh, are not so. Maybe they'll have a, a natural version of lye too that uh, we can spray weeds with and kill them. But this does a pretty good job. Any seedling weed, uh, just a good shot of this, uh, pretty much wipes out. If it's Bermuda grass now it won't kill it. Any other questions? Yes. How often should you be fertilizing your pesticides in general? Is there a schedule that you should follow? Or? Well, there's like the guys at the soil plant lessons, no one knows. And there's no way you can know either unless you come to doing soil tests or leaf tests. So on plants in general, if this is the leaf here, here's your center veins. So for whole leaf, you've got good color on it, good green, even color. You're probably okay on your fertilizer for the time being, especially you know, if you're watering amply and plants still growing, you're, you're in good shape. If the center vein starts to get pale on you, nitrogen. So if the center vein starts going pale on you, we know the same symptoms when you get root rot. So if you have root rot on a plant and you lose, you've lost your roots, you can't get fertilized up, your center vein goes pale. But in general, if you're lacking nitrogen, first thing that happens, well, the whole leaf can go pale, but a lot of times the first thing you see is the center vein and then the side veins start paling out too. But that's pale first and the whole leaf goes pale. From the center out, that's nitrogen. Um, we tend to have potassium in the area of problems too. So potassium um, on citrus is quite common here. And you get what looks like a green Christmas tree on a yellow background. So if you see that, that's lack of potassium. Now, if you got bad root systems, you get brown edges. 
They're normal for plants, so they're kind of doing the leaf dying, kind of dry off. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you've got new growth that looks healthy at the same time, there's no issues. If you're dropping leaves, yeah, plants do that. I mean, avocados do it worse than citrus. So, every time avocados get a new growth starting, all the old leaves are dying off. So, and some varieties of avocados do that way worse than others. And sometimes we'll see them totally go bare as they're growing new leaves. So, but citrus usually hang on the leaves for several years before they fall off. But that's about the only two that are easy. I mean, the other one that is easy but rarely seen is your new leaves come out real pale with green veins. That is iron. So that's on new growth. So going back to the frequency, you know, like two every month. You do a little bit every month, a lot every three months. I mean, no one knows. Now, if you've got a lot of duff on the ground, you may not need to fertilize much. I mean, one time I, I had a broken bag of chicken manure. I just threw it underneath my orange tree. Didn't have to fertilize that thing for three years. It just kept growing. I was amazed. This one bag of chicken manure. I mean, it, it, it had gotten wet. So it was just saw a mass of chicken manure. <laughs> it sat underneath my orange tree. And the next three years, that thing just grew. You're not like there's no set rule on that. I mean, you know, you can, I mean, a lot of times the nursery will just use aquifer and that'll last the whole crop. But uh, most fertilizers, you know, in pots, well, generally in pots, if you use organic stuff in pots, they say every, you know, my, the rule for my father's generation was once a month, you fertilize once a month. With anything where you know they had blood meal, bone meal, constant meal, they're fertilizing once a month, everything. And the ground, the ground generally holds fertilizer better than a pot does. Um, but again, you know, no one knows. Because that's that's the biggest problem is that fertilizer, we just don't know. Now, fortunately, only nitrogen is volatile. So you're not wasting too much. So you know, after you use uh, most of these complete, you know, fairly complete fertilizers for several years, generally, all you have to focus on is the nitrogen. So, you know, in the future, all you might need is blood meal or sulfate ammonia to keep the plants growing because your soil is not, is not usually losing the other minerals very fast. I mean, you can have a soil test then, so soil and plant lab in Anaheim um, you can call them, you can look on the internet and see that so you can get your soil test done and they'll tell you what you're starting at, which is kind of nice to know. So you, you'll know if you've got already a whole bunch of phosphorus in the ground, you never need to add it again and how much it's, you know, so it's nice to find out once. But, you know, the role of the soil is not, you know, so the University of California Davis, they went around the whole Central Valley and wanted to see how the different soils and the nutrients available affect the plant life. They, and their conclusion was it had no it, it had no difference, made no difference. No matter what the soil and it had, naturally it didn't make a difference. The same plants grew in the same part on the central life. They said all the plants needed was a deep layer of leaves on the surface. They said that, that they weren't getting any nutrition out of the soil itself. They're just recycling the dead leaves. So that was their conclusion that the soil doesn't matter. The pH doesn't really matter. Nothing really matters as long as you have a nice duck layer on top of them, at least the plants they were surveying. What's the name of the testing lab again? Soil and plant lab. Soil and, and plant lab in Anaheim. Do they do anything different than when they go to one kind of park starting and send it off to the test report? I think they sent it to Soil and Plant Lab. Oh, okay. uh, Soil and Plant Lab, I think, sends it to their lab in Georgia. Oh. They're a part of a network. So it takes a while to get your yeah, thing it takes a while, yeah. because they send it all the way down to Georgia. So, but yeah, it's nice to know where you're at just in case you're totally off on something, you know. Any other questions today? Yeah.
for doing, you know, I kept like an easy foot, too, easy foot, trying to be cleaned out those findings every week. So, I mean, like I have tennis forms growing along mm -hmm. the wall in the pine trees right there. I should just put all the pine leaves yeah. in under the, the tennis forms and mm -hmm. the fertilizer. Oh, yeah, down at Especially in the around deep Mississippi, Texas area, boy, they sell pine needles as a garden mulch down there. They sell it. So it's a big industry down there. Eucalyptus leaves are a big industry too in Florida. I know yeah. They said the only leaf they found that has any negative value that is, it would stunt plant growth is walnut leaves. It said walnut leaves would prevent the germination of certain seeds. But in general, the most leaves, it's not the plant's leaves that are causing trouble in the garden, it's the roots of the same plant. So if you got a hundred foot eucalyptus tree, you know, 80 foot from your yard, it's sucking all the water and nutrition out of your garden. So that that's it's not their leaves, their leaves are falling. And you think it might be their leaves, but it's the roots of the tree that are causing the trouble. I mean. I've talked to farmers who have those big 100-foot windbreaks, eucalyptus, and they said to me, they said, yeah, every five years, what we do is we run a trencher between the windbreak and the orchard to keep those, and cut all the roots out of it. Because if they don't do that, those windbreaks just take all the water and nutrition out of the orchard. So they have to run trenchers every five years, cut the roots. The roots are only a foot deep, so they have a two-foot trenching machine and it cuts all the roots off. So if you have neighbors with big trees, yeah, that's a problem. It can be a big problem. Those trees are too powerful. And that's one of the few reasons anyone would want to till a garden is to cut up the roots of all the plants in your garden or in your neighbor's garden. Get them out of your, you know, your vegetable area. Your vegetables have a chance. But if you put a raised bed, would that be all right? I don't have to dig out the pine tree roots. They can still get in there. I mean, you have to have a root bearer. So you put a root bearer on the ground, or you know, between the tree and your yard, dig a trench and fill it with concrete or plastic or something. Mm -hmm. Keep the roots from coming over. So again, roots only go down about a foot, but they can, you know, again, a twenty-year-old tree can have roots a hundred foot long. I mean, I've dug out twenty-year-old trees that had a hundred foot long roots, so we know they can really go far. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.